Yes. Yes. Hey. <laughs> Evening, everybody. Again. <laughs> We've said yeah. it all once already, but anyway, hello. Take two. We, we're <laughs> back with myself, uh, John Sales, uh, Gary Brown, and Mark Sargent, our guest tonight, who's talking about the flat earth theory. And uh, sorry about the technical difficulties, but, you know, God damn Skype. So yeah, yeah. I game the and I'm a priest, so I can do that. So they're in big trouble. Yeah. Yeah. So so at the risk of asking you to repeat yourself, Mark, That's we, all just, right. we was That's we nice. was talking about the, the conference the, the flat earth conference. Wh- which conference one do you want now. to talk about? Do you want to talk about the Edmonton conference or do you want to talk about the Denver conference? Well, well let's go with the one, one coming start. up. Okay, the one yeah, coming up. up. So, so yeah. the one People coming up at. in in November of this year in the United States in Denver, Colorado. Uh, it is going to be epic. There's going to just about every ranking member of the flat earth in the, at least the United States part, not necessarily the, the UK part. There's going to be a few people from UK, I think over, that are coming over, uh, are going to be there. And the last one we did in Raleigh was fantastic. And if the Canadian conference in Edmonton, which I just went to is any indication of how the Denver one will be, uh, I don't think anyone's going to sleep for three or four days. What, what sort of numbers do you get at these conferences, Mark? Because you, you'd kind of think that it was very fringe, you know, and you wouldn't get many people there. But are, no. you, are you filling seats? Oh, yeah, yeah. Last year we sold out. Uh, in fact, the, the VIP part, you know, it's so strange talking about flatter VIP tickets. I uh, sold out, I think, in two weeks. And then we had, I don't know, 500 and something in general attendance and then however many people were streaming it. So this year, I know they're expecting more. It's a completely different venue. You know, it's Denver, not Raleigh, and they we can we can hold a lot more. And everyone everyone that I've talked to and all the meetups that I've gone to, there are people in just about every group that are going to attend. You know, they're they're driving in for, or flying in from all over the place. Oh, interesting stuff. So it's because um, so, I was looking at um, a survey that was done, and and it. And it it said that uh, they, they did a poll of, of so many like millennials, but as it turned out, it wasn't just millennials. It was, I mean, millennials can color people up to, you know, whatever age now. Right. Um, and it said that uh, at the moment in America, it's, it's about 4% of people sort of believe the earth is flat. Yeah. And, and out of that, it's how many people were just deliberately making fun of the survey, if you know what I mean. Sure, sure, sure. So, but, but you say it is really gaining momentum. Oh, it's it's been in fact the the survey. Uh, hopefully, you're you're looking at the same one that that we were. The most interesting one, which I believe was done, oh boy, a few months ago, was done by U.gov, a scientific research facility yeah, out of the UK. That, that was it. Yeah, and was it, it really, <clears throat> excuse me, it really r- worried some people in science because the number that stuck out, of course, was the 18 to 24 year olds. Which yeah. and not oh Christ, they believe anything. They believe in Slender Man. God. Uh, well, they, that's that's just that's it though. Being, I mean, I have an eighteen to twenty year old, and she believed. She came to me one day and said, uh, "They found, uh, they found footage of Amelia Earhart. Right. What, what happened to her?" Right. And I'm like, "Really?" I looked it up, and I said, "I looked up fake Amelia Earhart photo, and it was something that was taken ten years before she was, before she took off." It, um, it's like this proves they were, she was with the Japanese. I'm like, okay, was this the picture? And she's like, oh. So you know, sometimes when you when you talk about that group in the 18 to 24 year old, I don't get really really excited about it because I kind of I kind of call that the knee jerk reaction group uh, because I, everything is a fact. I, I, yeah, I, I hear you, but at the same time, the number was outside of the of the scientific norm, if you want to call it that, where it was over a third of the 18 to 24 year olds were like yeah the globe globe has a lot of problems and it, it, you know in fact it raised the eyebrows of one particular group which was national geographic because they contacted me and they said uh, they they wanted to kind of do a follow up they wanted to do a story on this because they had already heard about the documentary so much has ta- happened since I've talked to you last uh, in fact, maybe I should back up real quick. I'll give you the whole context. So, have you heard of the documentary which was released at the Toronto uh, Film Festival Hot Docs uh, called "Behind the Curve"? No. Okay. Never heard of. 
So there was a documentary team that had followed uh, a bunch of flat earthers around last year, basically all of last year, and it culminated in the, the conference in Raleigh. And they released it. Fi- the world premiere was up in Toronto. It's called Be- Behind the Curve, and you can see it on BehindTheCurveFilm.com. It's not affiliated with any flat earth group. In fact, it's a globalist team out of Los Angeles. No no shock here. You know, producers, when they see something that, that's trending, they're going to follow it and, and do something with it. You know, can it be monetized? And so it got into the Toronto Film Festival. And about that same time, National Geographic was floating around, kind of looking for stories. And they had run into that U.gov survey. And this really sparked their interest. So they wanted to do something. And, and of course, they, they called and said, okay, is there anything happening? And I said, well, you know, there's a Canadian conference. It's like, eh, we're not going to go to Canada. And, and they said, well, how about the Denver? I said, how about the Denver conference? And they go, oh, no, that's too far off. We need something sooner. And so they decided they were going to, they said, is there anything happening in New York or Los Angeles? We have offices there and people we can get a hold of really quickly. And I said, well, there's this salt and sea test that a skeptics group is doing outside of Los Angeles, a couple hours east of Los Angeles at this Dead Sea that they were going to shoot some long distance photography and try to debunk flat earth. And that was, that was all spawned because of a little podcast called uh, Ross and Carrie out of Los Angeles. They interviewed me for two hours and they were so aggravated. They couldn't talk me out of the flat earth that they decided to get a hold of a skeptics group. Anyway, the point was, is that that, that survey you just mentioned, long story short, that survey that you mentioned has, has garnered the attention of a whole bunch of scientific groups because they don't have any uh, what, what way to explain it. I know you're going to say, well, it's the, new, it's the knee-jerk reaction thing. But it's, it's a little bit more than that because on top of that, the, the general numbers. Like, for example, if, if, for example, what was it? What did they say, like 3% of Americans, 4% of Americans, something like that? It was uh, it was two two percent say that they believe the Earth is flat, absolutely and believe the Earth two, is... another two percent that absolutely forever they believe it's flat. Okay, so, well, but, I but mean... there was a lot a lot of that. It was eighty six percent believe it's round, got it, or spherical, and got then it. there was others that oh I don't know or whatever, you know. So. And and that jibes with other countries as well. And you gotta remember, these are the people that are willing to to admit to a ta- you know to a census taker. You know, that, not not the rest of the people that like you know that that just can't can't actually say that to somebody. It's sort of like um, uh, not to uh, tie it to like the gay population, but everybody knows like half of them are out of the closet and half of them are in the closet because mm-hmm. they they just don't want to admit it. But there was a, a Russian survey that was done shortly afterwards. I think they followed suit after the uh, the British, where they same sort of numbers. Where I think it was three percent of the Russian population admitted to it. And you say, well, you know, it's not a lot. It's like, well, it is when you look at the raw numbers. I mean, 3% of the Russian population would be, I think, 4 million people. And every percentage point of the American population is over 30 million people. See, so, that's that worries me. I'm sorry, me. sorry, I'm sorry, <laughs> so, I'm sorry, over 3 million people. Oof, sorry, yeah, sorry, over 3 million people. That worries me. But it's, uh, <laughs> it was, yeah, it's it's a lot. I mean, we've we've grown to the point where... I have run into people unsolicited in just about every trip I've done where I, I'll, I'll give you three quick stories and give you an example yeah. of, of where this, where this is going. Um, I was at a thing in Palm Springs where I, I was with a bunch of flat earthers after a meetup and we just stopped at this little vegetarian grocery store cafe type thing. And we were sitting there really, really tired. It was a, it was a long shoot that morning. And the cashier is looking at us. She goes, what are you guys part of? And we said, flat earth. And she throws up, you know, the sideways hand sign that we do. Just throws it up to us. Absolutely unsolicited. It's like, holy smokes, you're what? And she goes, yeah, my boyfriend and I are totally into this. You mean you guys got your own gang sign? Come yeah, on now. We do. We do. <laughs> yeah, so you, just, you just put your, you hold your hand up, your arm up, hor- one arm, a left or right, doesn't make any difference, horizontally in front of your chest or head or whatever it is and you know that's the that's the sign um the other the other guy i ran into uh, recently was at the atlanta airport it was a guy from homeland security a young black guy couldn't have been more than 25 or so and my bag was getting secondary screening uh, go figure and i was wearing a i am mark sergeant t-shirt which is a whole another thing but i won't get into that right now and he's he goes is this your bag and i go yeah and so i'm walking up to him and he's looking at my shirt looking at me looking at my shirt looking at me and then finally he goes yo man you mark sergeant for real and i go yeah why 
And he goes, that's my name too. And he hands me the bag without checking it. And if you're wondering what that means, that mean it's a it's a Fight Club reference where we <laughs> we have a thing out there saying the first rule of Flat Club is you don't talk about Flat Club, and it was just freaky. And the last one, which I just got back from when I was traveling down to um, Los Angeles, was I was traveling in just an airport shuttle from from Seattle from here down to the uh, the airport, and I was sitting next to this woman, just this random woman, uh, mid thirties. And she was uh, very chatty and said, uh, hey, what do you do? And I said, well, I hate, you know, I'm going to softball this to you, but it's going to sound a little weird. I'm into flat earth. That's what I do. I make videos. I write books and, and stuff. And she goes, oh, really? And, uh, after I, and she goes, tell me more about it. So I gave her the nickel tour. And at the end of it, she goes, hey, um, do you have like a, a card or something you can, you can, you can write your name down on? Because I'd love to give it to my babysitter. And I said, your babysitter, why? And she goes, oh, she told me about Flat Earth like four months ago. I was like, get out of here. And she, I go, why'd you let me talk so long? And she goes, oh, because. She goes, I, I just was kind of curious. And so, yeah, I've, I, I run into this stuff all the time. And it's, yeah, it's grown by leaps and bounds. It's kind of scary when somebody does something like that. Because, I mean, what if this guy, like, he's looking through your bag, he's like, I put something in your bag. I know, right? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> oh no, I would. It would. We. I, it's Can one you of run my, this back through. <laughs> it's one of my fears that uh, that uh, that somebody somebody in the community will do something weird, super weird, or bad. But you know, we've been doing this now for the better part of three years, and to date, we have never had an incident. We've had a couple hundred meetups. Uh, conferences in the U.S., Canada, U.K., South Korea, uh, and New Zealand, and nobody's gotten in a fight. Nobody's, you know, blown up a post. Nobody's off. fallen off the earth. Nope, nope. Nobody's nope. fallen off the yeah. earth or anything like that. It's it's yeah. been really civil. It's it's a really happy group. I got to tell you. In fact, I just got I did a meetup just last night here in Seattle. I think we had like forty people at this particular one. This was North North Seattle. And the, I think there was the other thing was there's a lot more women involved in the flat earth than there are the other conspiracies. Usually your, your garden variety conspiracies run about 85 percent male and we're skewing more into like 70 percent. So that's that's pretty impressive. The fact that we can get women in this thing. Yeah, usually they think you're full of crap. Usually, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Women, women have a built-in detector, BS detector. Um, there's an old uh, that's the deal with the men. That's why there's an old sales pitch where you know they they tell salesmen when they're doing you know marketing and stuff. They, if you get a woman on the phone, you just hang up immediately, and it's why. And I'm not being crass when I say this. And the saying is, don't you don't pitch the bitch, you just don't do it. Oh jeez. <laughs> That's messed up. That's right. So, I have a question. That this is yeah. kind of a baseline thing. Um, mm -hmm. What things do you believe in besides this? So, I, I had a couple of questions for you to kind of baseline of where you're, where you sit, like in the conspiracy theory, um, unknown things, world stuff like that. Okay, so do you believe in ghosts? Um, I believe in interdimensional beings by the way you can ask anything you want about any conspiracy because okay. i i have an opinion on well, just about I, all of them. I, I just yeah i just want to know kind of where you're um, sitting i, be in I things. believe in, i believe in interdimensional beings but i don't think they're my dead grandmother type, okay. type of thing i mean i believe in look if everyone here a quick little uh context to that we all know that there's music flying around us right now, but you can't hear it unless you have a radio receiver. Same thing with television stations. There's entire visual spectrums that are happening right in front of our eyes. We can't see them because we don't have the you don't have the technology built into your head to see them. Uh, could that mean that there? You know, we I've always suspected there's been other dimensions. Could any of these dimensional people living in other dimensions could they somehow phase into ours? Yeah, possibly. We've been talking about it in science fiction for ever. But do I think they're de dead relatives, aka Poltergeist, the movie and sequels? No, no, I don't. Okay, how about Bigfoot? 
You live out in Seattle well, areas, right? Yeah, oh, Washington. Oh, yeah, yeah. Washington. It, well, it is. This is Bigfoot country. As a matter Bigfoot of fact, country. Yeah. The most funny enough, you'd ask that. The most heavily cited location for Bigfoot is just north of here, actually in Canada, in a place called Vancouver Island, which is the north. I'm sorry. From here, it's northwest, but for them, it's <laughs> southwest. Uh, it's basically the the most western edge of Canada is this giant island. Do I believe in them? I believe in something, but but again, I kind of tie them to interdimensional beings because I do. I think they're a natural process. No, uh, if there was, we would have run into a corpse at least once. Uh, you know, there's there's hunters challenges that have been out there forever. Uh, you know, if if a if a yeti or bigfoot or a sasquatch you know dies in the woods, somebody should find it. You know, somebody should find something, some sort of remains, anything. Unless you know, they eat it. Well, yeah, but even if you eat it, the, the skull would be the skull would be monstrous. You would yeah. find a freaking bigfoot skull somewhere. That that being said, there's an interesting story that I read here. I kind of think there's sort of a I, I, I hate to use a gaming reference, but I almost call them, uh, if you know games at all, I call them treasure goblins because <coughs> the, of this weird story I heard where a rancher on horseback with a, a lever action rifle had one at point blank range. And he said he, he could not have missed him and the thing just blinked out like it was never there, you know, like a like a special effect, just pop, just was gone. And, you know, I, I, out of all the stories, yeah, that's one of the ones I believe because we can't find any at this point. So who knows? So maybe pretty they're, much when it, go ahead. things within the paranormal, you're thinking interdimensional beings like Gary's favorite word, demons. Uh, oh. I mean, I don't, I don't mind. Oh, look, if, no. if, if we're going to drop the D word, I, I'm not going to split, I'm not going to split hairs here, but one man's demon is another man's alien. He's, he's being sarcastic. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah. we, like, there. I know a lot of people who consider all beings that, again, the general public might might regard as aliens, they would see them as absolutely, you know, demonic forces. So I was like, uh, you know, who's who? Because it, let's say an alien shows up in a, in a rural place out in, I don't know, in Amish country. They're going to look at him and, and say, oh, yeah, it's probably the devil's work. Or, oh, it is the devil's work. Anything in Amish, it's the devil's well, work. Well, yeah. So, yeah. yeah. So, <laughs> so yeah. you and Gary finally agree on something. That's awesome. <laughs> no, no, I can, look, I, can, I, can, I, I can get with him on the interdimensional thing because that's, that's a theory that I've been sort of toying with for a long time, which, which includes um, so-called ghost sightings, uh, aliens, you know, people are saying about the distances between stars. You know, you can't get the aliens right, here, right. but interdimensionally, it's it's another area that has to be explored, you know. So, so I can, yeah, yeah I, I can do that. Yeah, I I always thought it was fascinating that like Ghost Hunters, the show has been on, and all the various versions of it has been on for so long, and it's always you know the same script. Where, People are brainwashed to it. It's total uh, bullshit, it's, and everybody knows it. Uh, well, you'd think everyone would knows it. I I almost treat it like a World Wrestling Federation now. Where, in fact, South Park did a great joke on it where they were the kids were doing the ghost hunters bit and and they go, Wait, stop. You know, do you do you was it do you smell do you smell that or do you hear it? was always a sound, it was always yeah. a sound, never a visual. It's wait, do you hear that? You know, they're always like looking over their shoulders, you know, it always this little cliffhanger. It's like, Wait, what? And but because people love a mystery, they uh they jump on it. It's like, Yeah, whatever, whatever. I that and that and exorcisms and stuff. And I know, I look, I'm not trying to offend uh, Christianity and, and Christians. But oh, we do a good job of that on this show. Don't yeah, well, okay, you know, I'll, I'll let you. I should listen last you, week. <laughs> I'll let you do that. I just don't think. Look, I, I believe in a lot of biblical things. I was raised very, very Christian. But when it comes to ghosts and, and demons, until I get an, until I see one for myself. You know, I'm, I try to follow my own my own mantra, which is do your own research and ask questions. And I just haven't I just haven't had that experience yet. Okay, well, I have well, one well, more question. Yeah, I'm going, Scott. Question. Then I'm going to let Gary and John just ask you all the questions. John's being quiet, which is unusual. So <laughs> Allison, yeah, Allison be, must be afraid. Stuff. <laughs> <laughs> Mark, Hi, uh, Allison, I'm very interested. Hi. So, Hi, Mark. Hi. What was the one thing? 
Yeah. So everybody has a tipping point in everything that they that they research stuff like that. What was the thing that made you go like your epiphany that oh shit this is real? What was the one thing that that there's always one thing that, yeah. that hits you? Yeah. What yeah, was yeah. that? You? When I was trying to debunk flat Earth for the better part of nine months, I ran into something that bugged me. It wasn't on a supernatural level or paranormal or or any any outer limits episode type or twilight zone episode it was human nature which which was about admiral bird when he was down in antarctica you know he he was doing he, most of his life was spent from 1928 up until his death in 1957 was spent in antarctica doing this stuff and he was down there. Uh, he was he was doing a television show in 1954, and you can look it up online. It, the fact that we were so lucky to get the footage, it's out there uh, by a CBS fil- affiliate. It was a, a show called the the Long Jeans Chronoscope, and kind of like the 60 minutes of his day. And he was talking about how Antarctica was just. And remember, he had been down there for over 20 years at that point, basically just made out of money. And we're just going to carve this thing up like like a pie where you know, there, there's an entire mountain range made out of coal and there's minerals and there's uranium and there's oil and he was worried there's actually going to be disputes over this this place down there and he was getting ready for his last mission which was 1955-1956 uh, operation deep freeze and he goes down there and then something happened that's when the world changed was was 1956 because what he found down there which still to this day you know shrouded in mystery uh, although i have little doubt what i think he found uh was the outer marker they everybody all these countries that were down there getting ready to to bring in the corporations and and mine and strip mine and oil and gas and and you name it and fight over uranium uh, they all left the ice simultaneously like like their lives depended on it and I mean, I mean, big nations, nations that needed these resources like Russia, who is rebuilt, still rebuilding after World War Two and UK and Australia, and New Zealand and Argentina and Chile and so on and so on. And they all left almost immediately and started drawing up a treaty saying uh, the otherwise known as the Antarctic mm-hmm. Treaty, the only treaty that's never been broken, that says you can't go down there as a country, as a corporation under any circumstances forever. And that's it, you know, it's like they just lock the gates on this thing and it's not up for review until 2041. And it went against everything that at least I know as an American, which is, you know, our, our country runs off of, of greed and money and power. We, if we wanted to start, and we have, we want to start fracking in your backyard, we could do that real easily. And, and we have all over the country. We're, we're just paying people off or paying congress you know politicians often were fracking and yet nobody no court none of these corporations can go down to antarctica in addition I'll, I'll cut this part short you're not even allowed to talk about it that's the part that really bugged me it's not that just you you can't go down there which you know this this treaty was ratified in 1959 it's that you can't even protest it and we're talking about big con- countries that aren't exactly on the same wavelength as the United States back then. So a perfect example would be British Petroleum. Let's say I ran British Petroleum. How easy it would be for me to run a full-page ad in the London Times pretty much every month uh, for cheap and saying how great it would be for British Petroleum to go down to Antarctica and you know grease politicians' hands and you can make this thing happen. Nope not even allowed to talk about it. it is one at the highest level something was put into place uh, under the guise of national security or whatever you want to where any corporation president whoever it is the ceo of whatever these you know don't have to tell a lot of people says look if you ever run into this situation you you know this falls under some sort of government act and that's it and i that for me it was just too too overt because it was it's like okay what what conspiracy out there is bigger than money there is no conspiracy out there bigger than money money is the king of all you know golden rule and this was that this they decided and i knew why it, it was because th- you can't have corporations with that much money and that much technology down there you're gonna have a rogue plane a rogue helicopter uh, a rogue transport that is gonna go too far and even if they can't go too far, you're going to have to draw a line in the sand somewhere down there that says, oh, yeah, by the way, anything past this is off limits. 
And they they realized after going through meetings, because it's exactly what I would have done. I said, you know what? It's not worth it. It's just not worth the, the hassle. So let's just lock it down and keep it locked down for as long as possible. It's really a horrible place anyway. Not many people are going to do any tourism down there. So we'll just keep this a secret for as long as we can. And they did a, a, a excellent job for the last 60 years. So anyway, that was that was my turning point. Okay, very good. Hmm. So I'm actually looking at the Antarctic Treaty right now. I pulled it up on, online, and it it almost looks like they're saying they don't want to be used. They think that we're going to use some type of military thing. Is the first article hmm. is shall the Antarctica shall be used for peaceful purposes only. Yeah. There shall be uh, there shall be prohibited any Attila uh, of measures of military nature, such as the establishment of military bases right. and fortifications, carrying out military maneuvers, as well as is testing any type of weapons. Right. Now, when I was in the military, when I was in the Navy, I could have went to Antarctica Operation Deep Freeze because they do have something down there because they were looking for people to go. And they said, yeah, they give you like. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. The, mil the military can go down there. And if you're a scientist, uh, a very specialized scientist, you can go down there. And right. to be fair, if you're a tourist and you want to go down there, you can spend the ten, fifteen thousand $15,000. They'll take you to the peninsula and, and you can go around in the big orange rafts and have your pictures taken with penguins. Uh, but as far as interior, just running amok inside the interior, you have to go through, and we, there's some great videos on it uh, by other people, where you, the permits you have to apply for and the fees are just outlandish. Uh, and it has to be approved by multiple countries, which is, of course, the other thing that I talked about in the clues, which is nobody, no, nobody owns Antarctica. Uh, it is the one piece of real estate, and we're talking a big, big, even if you believe in mainstream science, a big, big chunk of land that nobody owns. And I, that's not the case everywhere else. Every other piece of a square inch of land everywhere else is owned by someone, and it's recorded by somebody, and you have to pay taxes on it. Uh, not this place. It's, uh, it's very, very special. So uh, John pointed out Sam has a question. So why don't you read it off, John, mm -hmm. Sam's question. Um, Sam asks, explain why you use fisheye lenses as an excuse for images such as a view from Everest or the kids from Plymouth, UK and their science experiment using a balloon that went high enough up to show the curvature of the Earth. So why, why do we complain about fisheye lenses? Yeah. Okay, the, the easiest way, and I'm going to do this for the listeners because I'm sure you guys know. Um, if you if you don't know what a fisheye lens is, I also call it a peephole lens, which is you know when you're when you're looking through a peephole in your door, you know that the hallway absolutely isn't curved in any way, shape, or form. But when you look out that lens, you know you see a curved hallway, and that's because you need more. You want to get the maximum amount of visual range. Uh, when it comes to fisheye lenses, it it there's too much distortion on even on on the ground level. Uh, the most famous one, and the mainstream media really jumped on this, was the Red Bull jump uh, fairly recently where the guy goes up to, I don't know, about 130,000 feet, but he has a fisheye lens on the outside, multiple fisheye lenses on the outside of his capsule or whatever you want to call it. And it made the, it, the curvature of the earth was so severe that, yeah, if you want to see the earth is curved, fine, but only if it's as big as the state of Arizona. It's very, very, you know, it, it distort, it creates an artificial curve to such a degree that it's, it, it, it can't even be remotely seemed as realistic. Whereas, you know, uh, anything else, uh, like even barrel distortion lenses aren't great. Pin cushion ones are a little bit better, but w sorry, let me finish this. The, uh, the Red Bull jump on the inside of it. Which was more interesting was they used a standard lens on the inside of the capsule. So when he was looking out his window, when he was just sitting there waiting to take the jump, that horizon was perfectly flat. So which is it? You know, is it is it perfectly flat or is it severely severely curved? Uh, sorry, the fish. And I get it. I get it. The fisheye lens is a is a great tool for the GoPro industry, and it gives you way more um, a visual spectrum uh, when it comes to you know filling in filling in the gaps it's a more dramatic picture but it, it does not help us in the slightest kind of, kind okay of. so um 
you were talking about shooting lasers over long distances. And we had yeah. seen, uh, like last time we had you on a show, we did some research um, where a guy took a laser across a lake. I forget where it was, Gary. I, I sent you the video. Yeah, I can't, so basically, I can't where it was, mate, but it's... Um, the lake it's was per- 30 miles, okay. yeah. 30 miles long. And they went out in a boat, and they they had the lasers, you know, level and everything. Right. Um, and at 15 miles, it was... The laser was above the boat. Okay. And at 30 miles, they they waited till the laser hit, and they had a helicopter... Oh like, yeah, yeah. All right, all right. I know this video. This is the disco- okay. this is the Discovery Channel video. In fact, okay. this particular video uh, irritated us so much that we had went out and reproduced it ourselves in Hungary at a lake called Oh boy, I'm going to butcher the name. A lake Peloton, Bel- Peloton, Peloton. I think it was uh, just recently and during during cold weather. We shot I think about 40 kilometers. We had the Guinness Book of World Records with us. And it was perfect. It was exactly what we thought. That production, and I'm not trying to be mean here when I say this, that production uh, with the Discovery Channel and the he- helicopter, and I believe Stephen Hawking even made an appearance in that, uh, was absolute trash. It was, there was nothing, or the British say rubbish. It was, there was, there was nothing redeeming about that. Uh, it was shot for dramatic effect. It was all just cut edits and demographics, and it was, it was awful. Uh, we, we did it in, in Hungary. It was perfect, absolutely flawless. In fact, you don't even need a laser to do this test. Laser's more, uh, more direct and it's more dramatic, but you don't need a laser. We had a husband-wife team that the key is cold weather, believe it or not. That will reser- reduce atmospheric lensing and atmospheric distortion and, and the Fata Morgana effect down to almost nothing. We had a husband-wife team just on their own, completely unsolicited, go to a, a lake, and I think it was eight miles from from end to end. Uh, and the lake was almost frozen to the point where all they took d- took was a, a squarish flashlight and they literally set it on the ice. So, you know, we're talking like zero, zero inches off the or zero feet off the water. And then he set his camera only a foot off the water, you know, also on the ice on his side. And the lake wasn't totally frozen yet, but the edges were definitely starting to freeze over. And they had cell phones, and they just talked to each other, and it was perfect. They could absolutely see each other uh, without without a, a single glitch in the whole thing. It was it was fantastic. So no, we've we've done that test a whole bunch of times. Where any and that Discovery Channel thing doesn't doesn't scare us in the slightest. Yeah, it just don't add up, Mark. It really does. I mean, it's um. So the Guinness Book of World uh, Records sanction thing, you, you're not buying it. No, not at all. Okay. I, I don't know. I don't what know. I, I could I send you the hundred-page paper if you want. You, you, you can do it by all means. But you want um, you want the video on it as well, or do you have to yeah, actually be no, there? As, as, as much as much as you can give me, I would love it. Please, sure. I, I like to research stuff. But um, no, I, the the one I saw was um, it was a boat. It was a high-powered laser, mm-hmm. um, and the boat drew a line on the side. You know, they actually drew a, side, a line on the side of the boat. And as the boat went further and further and further away from the shore, the laser started creeping above the line, mm. which is consistent with Earth's curvature. And that you know, was so, that we're ta- still talking about the Discovery Channel video. I don't know if that was the Discovery one or not. Hel- helicopter I can't say one? for definite. No, I, I don't remember seeing a helicopter in it. Yeah, send it to but, me. Um, but it is, I mean, it's easily, you, you don't even need all that. I mean, it's like I mentioned before to you, anybody that's spent a lot of time at sea, myself uh, and Scott have, and you, you can see the ships disappearing over the horizon hull first. The hull disappears, then the superstructure disappears, and then you can see a mast. And the only way that would work, I mean, flat earthers will say it's perspective. Well, perspective only covers the fact that objects look smaller the further away they get. Now, if that was the case, if I grabbed a pair of binoculars, I would be able to see the ship again clear as day. But I can't because it's we, disappeared we can, over the horizon. We can and we can do it all day long, six days you a week or twice on I've Sundays. I've done it. I have spent since the age of 13 at sea, Mark. I know. Scott's the same. I have seen it. So we're so right. we're not seeing this with our digital zoom. We're not seeing the boat come back into frame. 
when it goes far, yeah, far yeah. into the distance. Well, somebody's somebody's either lying or they are. You've got weird something weirds happening. Got it. I, I have seen it on several, several occasions because we're trying to identify a ship on the horizon and we can't identify it because we can only see the mast. And that is with a pair of high powered binoculars. And then eventually you see it come over the horizon. You can see the flag. You can identify it. Hmm. So well, it one of the things also on... is if you're at sea, they they have a thing on, on every ship called a signal bridge. You have a signalman that either does Morse code or that does the flags. Uh, and they're always up at least on the O4 level uh, of any ship. They're right. never on the, you know, on the, the the deck. They're always on the O4 level, the highest one of the highest levels you can go before you hit antennas and things like that. Right. So your signal bridge are always high, so you can see further. Mm -hmm. Because uh, when they talk about signaling, uh, they say you know at this at at sea level you can see X amount of miles. Right. When you go to the O1 level, you see X amount of miles. When you go to the O2 level, you see X amount. It's always at a greater distance whenever you're higher up. Sure. Yeah. Which would make sense with the with the curvature. Of but the it Earth. doesn't make sense with a flat that you can see high, higher, farther when you get up higher. No, it doesn't well, make sense because if, well, even because... at sea level, if you had a powerful enough telescope, you should be able to see the mm. wall of ice at the edge of the world. Wow. So you, you know absolutely nothing about atmosphere at all, really. It's nothing to do with atmosphere. Okay, okay. First off, what you're breathing... Nothing to do with atmosphere. Shush, shush for a second. No, no, what, no, 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 no. I'm getting okay. this in. So the atmosphere you you're breathing... You can get anything you want in. That's the, fine. The, the atmosphere you're breathing right now, is it perfectly transparent? <clears throat> no, it is not. You are breathing just a lighter version of water. It is four parts nitrogen to one part oxygen. It is a soup. You can only right. see so far underwater, and you can only see so far through the atmosphere. If it's a vacuum, then I will give you this, because people have asked me this straight from the beginning. They say, hey, why can't you see Japan from San Francisco? And I say, well, that's because you're looking through thickness. Eventually, you're just going to be so much distortion because you're looking through so much atmosphere, you're not going to be able to see anything, even if you take the weather away. Now, if you pulled off the atmosphere and it was just a vacuum, yeah, you probably could see Japan from San Francisco. But you can't because we are living in and breathing in a thin version of water. And that's your argument. That, that is my argument. argument. Absolutely, right. it's it doesn't. My it doesn't. It doesn't hold up at all, Mark. I'll tell you for why. Why? Um, I should be able to see with a perfect pair of a perfect telescope. Now I can see the rings around Saturn. I can see other galaxies, mm -hmm. and that's through this thick atmosphere. Ah, and yeah, through, but, it's, but it's getting thinner as you look up. Remember, the atmosphere gets thinner really, really quickly as you're as yeah, you're going I'm, higher. I'm just, yeah, but I'm talking at an extreme. I should be able to see 40 or 50 miles down the road with a powerful enough telescope, shouldn't I? Well, you can. If the weather's cold and, if the weather's cold enough, you absolutely can. You can look up look up long distance photography. That's not even us. That's mainstream. Long distance photography, I think the world's record is 260 miles. And that's okay. peak now that's peak to peak. That's not ground peak level. Peak. Yeah. But and okay, it's, so it's if I was at ground level and I was looking at a, a skyscraper, yeah. let's say 50 miles away, right. I should be able to point my telescope at that skyscraper and see someone walking through the door of the skyscraper. I can't. All I can see is the top two thirds of the skyscraper. And that's fact. Wait, that's not whoa, me whoa, making whoa. it up. It, it, well, you, you just killed your argument right there because at 50 miles, at 1,700 feet, you shouldn't be able to see a skyscraper at all. You can see them. Well, how, how can on you how high it is. No, 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 no. I'm talking beach level. It, have you not done any research on our stuff at all? At all? No. And do you know why? Why? Because it's crap, Mark. So you're in denial. It doesn't how make can I argue sense. with you if you're not even going to look at our material? We've been because looking at the globe it... stuff for three years straight, and you're not even going to look at our stuff? Mark, I you're got you even, on last time for two hours. This... Two hours, Mark, kids. and debunked everything you said. Oh, my God. Everything. Everything. If, if, you will not, if you will not look at our material, then why are you even here with me? Same reason that I don't research the tooth fairy or santa claus got it doesn't got it so, so denial basically that's it that's, yeah, well, you're just gonna you're just gonna you're just gonna put your head in the sand you're not gonna look at our stuff you're just gonna okay what's what's the terms i'm looking for 
Um, name calling isn't rebuttal. Yelling isn't rebuttal, and profanity isn't rebuttal. Ignorance well, we're is not also not calling. rebuttal. Didn't, did anybody hear me name call? I didn't. No, 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 no. I threw in a fourth one, which is ignorance. If you're not going to look at our stuff, it's not you ignorance. Don't, you don't get to condemn this. it. You don't get to condemn it. I don't need to research what condemnation, is pseudoscience. Condemnation without investigation is what was the saying there? It's the height. It's the height of ignorance, and you are living proof on it right now. You have. You are just proof. Do you want to continue this? Do you want to, do you want to continue okay, this, okay, or should I kids, walk right now? On, you got ten hold seconds. On. Hold on, kids. Let's just back it off a little bit, and because we. We always have a free, um, a free exchange of ideas on here, and that's why we had Mark come on the show—not to sit there and screw with him, but to have a free exchange of ideas to listen to each other and to talk about the things that we're that we're looking at here. Uh, Mark has a theory about flat Earth that it, it, to be honest with you, Mark, I'm sure you get this all the time. It does go completely against mainstream science completely against physics, completely against geometry, completely against, um, sure. It, you know, uh, absolutely. It, it does. We're, we're not talking so, that people in flat earth walked into this blindly. No, I understand. <laughs> but what I'm saying is, is that, um, when we, when somebody looks at, at the stuff that you're talking about, you guys are, are like fact, fact, fact. And, you, we have thousands of years of of mathematics, science. Try try you know, five hundred like, for one. Five hundred, okay, five hundred years. But but Ooh. even when geometry was invented, when was that? When geom when a guy figured out the circumference of the Earth, a couple thousand years ago. Yeah, yeah. Hey, if if you're gonna go back that far, then you're gonna have to throw out Copernicus. You can you can start going to the libraries and burning his stuff down now. Okay, I don't want to burn anybody's stuff down. Well, I'm, I'm just, just saying, saying that... Copernican model, that's what everyone attests to. And then, but when we say it only goes back 500 years, the people immediately say, no, back, it's 2000. I go, okay, you can't have it both ways. Either okay. Copernicus started this or he didn't. Don't go to back to the Greeks and then say, if you're going to go back to the Greeks, fine, we're going to burn all of Copernicus's books. <laughs> I don't want to burn anybody's books. But what I'd like to say is that it's and I'm sure you have this all the time when you when you talk to people is that people look at the mainstream <laughs> models of science and you guys are going completely against all the mainstream models of science. That's right. And, we absolutely are. And not and that's fine, but you know not, it, not but we're doing we're not doing it because we hate science. I love science. Absolutely okay. adore science. But you, none of us got into flat earth because we thought it was the most fantastic idea since sliced bread. We got into it because we tried to debunk it. Some people took a few months. I took a lot longer. Sometimes it resonates quickly. Sometimes it doesn't. But everybody starts the same way. And that is flat earth is ridiculous. It's stupid. I'm going to shut it down. I should be able to break down the stuff in a very short amount of time. And that's never how it plays out. The t-shirt literally reads, I became a flat earther because I treated, I try to debunk flat earth. But the point is you have to look at it. You've actually got to look at this stuff. Now you want to hold your ground and say, yeah, well, flat earth is dumb and, and I'm not going to look at it. That's fine. That, that If that's the stance you're going to take, but you can't say it's debunked based off of that. You can't. We've, well, we've one made thing too much material at this point. One thing I looked at, and I, I looked up um, something in a Shooter's Bible. You know what Shooter's Bible is, right? It's everything sure, about sure, guns sure, and sure. stuff like that. Sure. And one thing I looked at was we talked about last time was the Coriolis effect. And right. in the Shooter's Bible with snipers, it says that in the Northern Hemisphere, your bullet is always going to drift right. In the Southern Hemisphere, your bullet is going to drift left because right. of the Coriolis effect. Yep. Um, uh, now, these are snipe. This is the Shooter's Bible saying this. And snipers that shoot long distance. Yeah. And I say it'll drift. At, what's your. Oh, I've got so many military guys that contacted me unsolicited after this. And we're not just not just talking snipers, which I had two of them. I also had a United States Navy missile instructor, an Air Force navigator, a Navy submarine chief, an artillery radar operator and a U.S. Army master gunner. And that's tanks, by the way. 
they all said the same thing and they said oh yeah yeah we we know the 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 formulas we know in fact these these guys are shooting way remember the sniper only goes up to about a mile the artillery guys are up where in tank guys are upwards of 20 miles and the navy guy who's even more fascinating because he's going ship to ship with a two degree beam radar at 50 nautical miles and they have to paint that with a with a beam radar right we're not bouncing off any stratosphere or anything like that and he goes not only are we hitting targets that we shot should not be able to hit but nobody and i mean not one of these guys said that they took into account the coriolis effect all said the same thing we've heard about the formula we know it's in the book somewhere nobody uses it it's a myth it's just something that was put out there that you know to, to fit in with mainstream i don't know like i say i i did some research on that and I found like five or six different things that were talking about long distance shooting over sure. a thousand yards. Sure. And so that's I, what you're saying is is you have to attest depends on north or south, um, north or the southern hemisphere, and they have to then they have to to adjust for gravity and that because is your bullet the further it goes the more it's going to drop just because the inertia is going to run out right. and gravity is going to drop right. so. Hey, all I can tell you is that when you're sh shooting at one mile, that's nothing. Try again. Try shooting an artillery shell at 20 miles. In fact, the, the tank guy was, was pretty eloquent where he says, do you know how hard it would be to plot in a firing solution onto a 20-mile shot if you had to figure out? Because remember, if you're talking about the Coriolis effect, not only do you have to know, you know, your windage and elevation and all that, but you also have to know what that geographically where you are, because the spin of the earth would change depending on where you were, not just northern and southern hemisphere, but where you were in that northern hemisphere. Because remember, if you're spinning a thousand miles at, at the equator, you're spinning zero miles an hour at the North Pole and South Pole, which means you'd have these ranges. He goes, he goes, it would be impossible. Even with modern technology, it would be really hard to do. He goes, so how were they doing it in World War II with nothing digital? He goes, it doesn't exist. Every one of these guys, the exact same thing. And I've done, they're all shows. It's not like these are secret conversations. They're all on my radio shows. They all contacted okay. me independently. Okay. That's cool. And, you know, I've, I've been contacted by people just not to, to um, argue or anything like no, that. No, you but can rebuttal it. That's people. fine. Uh, no, not even. But, you know, people get excited with ideas. I've had people tell me. They could they could have a ghost form in front of me, right. and I'm like, show show me. I don't believe it. I'm just like, show me. And they're like, oh, we'll do it later, and it, it never happens. So, hmm. you know, I think when people get involved in something, they get kind of excited and stuff like that, and they uh, they I, definitely uh, all you of know, the, if if that was the case, I would expect to see, and it is a massive list I got in front of me. And that I would have expected to see at least one of these guys recant their testimony. But not only that, I would have expected military guys to come and come at me anonymously and rebuttal these guys, you know, and say, no, I was in the Navy. I was in the Marines. I was in the Army. And I'm telling you, all, all his calculations are completely wrong. Nobody, not even once. They uh, nobody was willing to go up against these guys. And that was a testament to their. In fact, the, the last guy I had was, oh, geez, a couple months ago, was United States Navy electronic warfare technician and, you know, on on Navy ships. And he says, we're we're plotting stuff out on radar that are far, it's far beyond what radar should be able to hit. Yeah. So. OK, so. Um... John, you want to add anything in there? Because they've been doing some, the guys have been doing some research on this stuff, and I think they have some questions that, like, I had a question about the Coriolis effect with the shooting. Mm -hmm. Now, with a ICBM, you have you got something that's shooting. You have a missile, right? Shooting at, you know, not subsonic but ultrasonic when they're going out because you can't catch them with a plane. I'm shoot ICBM. No plane's going to catch it. Not even not even Iron Man's going to catch an ICBM if it goes off. Mm -hmm. So, um, just a thought on that, hmm. because, you know, like I said, I, I, it, it's a tough pill to swallow. It's, oh, uh, I, I don't doubt it. Here, here's the other thing real quick and something to think about, which is when does a plane become a bullet and when does a bl bullet slow down enough to become a plane? Meaning when you're firing an object fast enough, sooner or later, it's going to say, well, it's going to break away from the, the gravitational pull a little bit at least and we never see that meaning a plane some planes are very very fast and commercial airliners aren't very fast at all so shouldn't the planes also be taking into account the coriolis effect a little bit maybe 
I don't know. Not a pilot. I have no clue. I can't. <laughs> all I no all the pilots I've talked to say that they don't run into that. They, it, it's just, it's just, again, in fact, the pilots that I've talked to, and again, I have a list. In fact, a lady that was uh, uh, benched at KLM Airlines out in, uh, or is it the Netherlands, because she said that she was a flat earther, and they said, you're not going back up until you renounce it. That was just this year. But they all said the same thing, which is, yeah, when we're up in, in the cockpit, we absolutely see a flat horizon at every altitude. And yet, we are told, since we're children, that it's a globe. So it's this weird paradox. And I say, why don't we have more pilots come out about this, you know, and talk about this? And they say, well, because most pilots are so distracted by other things that they, they, it's just not a, in the first thing in their head. Usually, if you can take off from point A and land at point B and nobody crashes and nobody dies, that's good. And so then you just rinse and repeat and you start the whole process over again. And... I, the, the pilots, everyone I talked to said the same thing. They, they said, well, yeah, we've all heard about the curvature of the earth. We've all heard about the Coriolis effect. We do not use it in our nine to five lives. Okay. All right, John, you got any uh, questions for Mark? You've been quiet. Well, yeah, um, if, if the earth is flat, then why do we need seasons? Because it would be the same all over the earth because the, the, the sun is going to be shining on the whole of the earth at the same time. So we don't even need a day and night on different parts of the earth. That is a good question. That work? No, that's a good, that's a good question. Uh, in the, the flat earth, again, this is for the listeners, it, the sun and the moon are much, much smaller. It's not just the, the earth is flat and or enclosed in my case. It's not that it's just one giant sports stadium, Petri dish, Hollywood backlot, whatever you want to call it, pizza box, cake box. Uh, it's that the sun and the moon are tiny, 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 tiny fractions of themselves. They're just lights in the sky. And those lights can only reach so far. Uh, even if you want to call it a quasi-directional light, I don't know. But the sun and the moon would be less than 50 miles wide, maybe 3,000 miles high, give or take, which is just just a pin, just a, a pinprick in the in the sky by comparison to the the shape of the earth and we've done not only computer models but physical models that show that it wouldn't the light wouldn't be able to see be seen from everywhere if it's really really small it's a common it's a common thing where people say wouldn't you wouldn't the light shine everywhere it's like yeah the sun was still really 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 big but you don't need a really really big sun if the if the world is flat Okay, yeah. Well, I'd, I'd personally use um, the inverse square law where light is always remaining a constant. Gotcha. I hear you. But then, but, but then, but then I'm a scientist, so, 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 so that's how I'd, I'd look at it. Um, another thing is, um, how does gravity work on the Earth if it's not a globe and it's not spinning? Got it. Because if it was spinning as a flat Earth, mm -hmm. then centrifugal force would push us all out to the edges. If, if the flat Earth was spinning... And just about everybody in the community thinks that it is stationary. And I won't use the biblical stuff here. Uh, so instead of gravity, and it's really not that much of a difference when it, between a, a globe Earth and a flat Earth when it comes to this. On a globe Earth, everything is being pulled towards a center, kind of like at a, That's right, like at a mass. angle. But in a flat Earth, everything's just being pulled straight down. Uh, nothing's spinning uh, many, so there's no centrifugal force on the outside edge uh, it's just it's just being pulled down and again I, I, I throw it back at science because uh, even your best scientists will say I'll quote Neil deGrasse Tyson even though I know he's not the best scientist he's more of a spokesperson where he says look we can't tell you what gravity is we can only tell you what it does and that's the same thing we 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 say it's like okay fine if it's mass then it's pulling straight down that's it. Well, this is it. This, this, this is this is what physics tells you that anything with mass that creates its own gravity create, sure. turns itself into a globe. So, so, so what is if if, if it's an organic force flying through an endless gravitational null of space, maybe sure. But we're saying that it's an enclosed world. That's that again. It's it's just conditioning because the common questions say well you know what's outside of this is it a disc floating in space and i said who who said there was space you know if space can be simulated there doesn't have to be space if if you're in a giant planetarium this planetarium could be sitting on god's desk as far as we know so all the planets revolve around us still then the, same we're, thing we're, who, we're the, we're the 
we're, we're the center of our own solar system. Center of what solar system? I mean, again, the solar system we're in because uh, we've got the planets. Who, 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 who told you the, the planets were that far away? NASA? The United States military? Those guys? Who says it's, it's, it, all, it's all done by measurement? I mean, for, for a start, Saturn is 746 million miles away. Says who? Yeah, when it's low on the horizon with my telescope, mm -hmm. I can still split the Cassini ring. Right. And I'm looking through the thickest part of the atmosphere right. at any given time of the year. Even the other night I was out there looking at it. Sure. And it's quite low on the horizon. Sure. Why, why not? Uh, but who's to say you aren't looking at a display system? When you go into a planetarium right now and you look up at the moon... You can take a pair of binoculars in planetarium, and if it's a decent enough planetarium, you look and say, "Yeah, yeah, the moon looks pretty good." Is it? Is that moon two hundred thirty-seven thousand miles away? No, no, it's right there on the ceiling. Uh, so the question is, when you walk out of that building, who says you just didn't walk into a much bigger building? See, I think the whole ceiling thing with the moon and the stars and the satellites, I think that's a little much for me because, mm. it, because and apparently, held up and stuff, yeah. Well, I mean, because if you if you, I guess the hardest thing for me to wrap my hand, my head around with this whole thing, Mark, to be a hundred percent honest with you, sure. is this thing. If 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 the Earth is, I think last time we talked about, it, you believed that the Earth was covered by a dome. Right. Is that correct? Right. Okay. So the the Earth mass right. is like seven hundred or eight hundred million miles. Is what to calculate. We're talking square mass. square miles, just flat yeah. flat square just, mile. Just, yeah, just to, the surface of the Earth is measured at um, like eight hundred million miles, or something like that. some crazy no, it amount. Can't, it can't be that high. But but anyway, go ahead, go ahead. Let me, let really me uh, I get the number up here. There's somebody I, I pulled up today. No, it's okay. But, and, but there's a point behind it. So it's all right. I'll take whatever number you throw out is is fine. So. To build something this ginormous, right. I mean, to, to have this flat, as the Earth is flat, to have this and surrounded by an ice cream, right. and then to build a dome over top of it, right. okay, would be a unfathomable to us. Yes. yes. Oh, to, yeah. To us, it's absolutely unfathomable. No different than an ant farm looking at the walls of it and can't comprehend how they were built. Uh, who's this? I mean, think about this. I, I know some of you guys are science fiction fans. Look, this is not exactly the, the, the newest concept in the world. We've written stories about this probably since the 1950s that cover this very topic. Didn't you? It's kind of like lottery tickets. Didn't you think that at least one of these stories, because I think we've covered pretty much the gamut of the possibilities of what this world could be in, in, in literature. Isn't it, isn't it possible that one of these stories was right? That somebody built us, you know, a, a technology, a civilization that was far, far beyond ours that put us in just a, a big old giant hamster cage and let us run around or just watching us or older versions of us. Who knows? Yeah. But that's well, the I found a thing. It says uh, the surface land area is about one hundred and forty eight million three hundred thousand square kilometers. Oh, yeah, that sounds and about right. And the water area is 361,800,000 square kilometers. Okay. So you're looking at almost 500 million kilometers. Pretty close to that, right? right? And you, you got whatever you have to convert it down to. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, anyway. the miles. But yeah, yeah it's uh, massive. Absolutely massive. But it doesn't have to be – it doesn't have – you're thinking of it like it's a, it's, like it's really, really, really big thing, even though you're absolutely willing to accept – uh, a solar system and galaxy, which is thousands and millions, not, not the solar system, but the galaxy, millions of light years across. That, that you know, stuff that boggles even the, the most hardened mind. But building a small structure like this, by comparison, that's, that's the part that's, that's difficult? Nah. Nah, this, this we've been built. I use, again, I don't want to use too many movie references here, but the Truman Show... Look what we could do with just whatever that thing would have cost, like a billion dollars to build, you know, a 20 mile wide dome. Could you fool people inside it into thinking that it was real? Yes, you could. Uh, in fact, the only, the only reason you had the Truman Show is because you had deliberate production mistakes. Could you build something? Could, now, could we build it? No. No, of course we couldn't. Could an advanced civilization? Sure. 
why not? You know, we could, this is not beyond the, it's just scale. It's just scaling. Engineering wise, I am sure our best engineers could come up with a way to do it. Now we wouldn't have the resources or, you know, that we'd have to come up with some advanced technology to build something like this. But I think you could at least draw up the plans for it. Why not? Yeah, but the plans would be, well, you know, like I say, who knows? It's just such a... I know, I know. And, and the thing is, I guess the other question is why? I mean, and... You mean why build it or why keep it a secret? Why cover it up? Yeah, it's, why? Well, okay, it's, okay, which... It's, uh, it's, it's such a massive secret that the governments wouldn't be able to cover it they up. They wouldn't, You're, and, and that... I, I will absolutely give you that. They wouldn't be able to cover it up forever. They could delay it. That's the best they could hope for. Meaning, but then surely they can't do that by now because there's so many people that that, that are following in in the flat Earth society. There's, there's people all around the globe in the flat Earth society. No, I've never never heard that one. That's good. The uh, yeah, it's, I bet it's, you haven't. <laughs> no, no, it's it's one of the no. I've, I've yeah, that meme has been around for. If I see that in the comments section anymore, I'm just gonna freak out. So. When you're talking about hiding it, and we're talking about the government's hiding it, it is information is power. And do you really want to go to the world? And until you can figure out how to use it to your advantage, do you really want to go to the world in 19, let's say 1960 and say, oh, yeah, by the way, the world's not a globe anymore? Because at that point, civilization has already been established. I mean, yeah, it's not exactly what we are now. We're, we're really, really integrated now. In fact, it's worse now. But back in 1960, you had all your countries set up and all the cities set up and everything's ready and, and you know, it's an industrial-based world. Uh, you're, you're talking about too many disruptions, potentially, um, academic, uh, monet um, economically, and, and religion. Uh, academically, literally, I mean, that the academic shockwaves alone would be incredible. You'd have astrophysics and astronomy. They'd have to shut down overnight. They wouldn't reopen. And then all your remaining sciences, you know, geology, biology, archaeology, take your pick. They would all have to be retooled to the new model. Um, economically, world markets, even back in 1960, you would have to suspend trading for a, a good amount of time until you could figure out how the when the dust settles how this thing would all play out but the biggest one by far would be the religious angle and that is the the we'll just pick the big five religions um hinduism buddhism uh, judaism islam and christianity you'd all you'd be telling them all simultaneously that intelligent design whether or not it's the divine or not right you know it doesn't doesn't really matter because they're going to believe it's the divine you're telling them that science was wrong about some very, very big concepts. In fact, the, the biggest one so far. And you're asking them to restrain themselves and not go after those houses of science. Not go after them and say, oh yeah, so you were wrong about this globe thing, which you've been pushing on us for 500 years at least. Uh, what else are you wrong about? You, you're wrong about evolution? You're wrong about the Big Bang? And, and it would be a huge, huge blow. And remember, science is, is the new church out there. And, you know, we're all benefiting from the fruits of its labor, but they had a responsibility to, to not abuse their power. And in this case, that's what it would be seen as. And so that, that's why you would hide it. it, it it's, not, it's not a long meeting. Because all you have to do is, is list off those things. It's like, oh, what's the worst that could happen? Oh, I don't know. People running through the streets with torches and pitchforks. Well, that would be the same thing if um, the governments came to us and said there is alien life. They've been visiting and they can take good you know, specimens, people. The exact same thing would happen. Everything would be potentially but but they've and that's a really really good point you brought up there because they have been conditioning us whether deliberately or not deliberately you know how how much control they've had over you know in mainstream media we've gotten to a stage now where we've had so many movies regarding some sort of alien life form just take your pick there's so many to choose from going all the way back to the um mid 1950s that everyone living currently has a reference point in that regards so yeah in fact we the social media is already set up so if you did want to let's say release uh knowledge of an advanced alien life form or an inter interdimensional life form or whatever it was i don't think the population would freak out as much i think their first question everyone on everyone's mind would be who did they most resemble <laughs> 
you know what what alien that we've looked at you know are they the um are, are they et are they uh a childhood end are they you know you take your pick are they the aliens from 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 the, from the movie series aliens are they predator we we but everyone would have a reference and so i don't think they would burn everything down if they found out they were aliens they would be more curious than than anything else that's my opinion I think there's more people open to that, but my next question would be, how are they going to get in the dome? Ooh, also a good question, which is, what are the aliens? You know, it, let's say, I don't even like calling them aliens. I like, well, you call them, let's call them aliens. Heck, we call people from other countries aliens. Um, <laughs> are they, are they inside here with us or, you know, are they trapped in here with us? Or are they able to come in from the outside? You know, to, can they come in interdimensionally or is this room is this building sealed off uh are and what relation do they have in here i've always been a big believer that we're not the first people to rent this apartment by any stretch you know there's old, there's older civilizations been roaming around for a long time uh you know and and there's there's hints of it all over the place like like the sunken um cities off of india and japan and uh the bosnian pyramids and how old are the real pyramids and bimini road and all that also it's been around for a long long time i think that every civilization has their time here whether it be a few thousand years or ten thousand years and then once they reach their apex and whatever happens then they move on like a like a graduating class in a school and then a new freshman class comes in and then if there's any remnants left over wherever they go i used to kind of think that they'd go to a, a subterranean place because you don't need much of a, a of an area a height to to store a civilization but they may be them i mean i i've looked with night vision many times out in the sky and this place this place is crawling with things uh, but they seem to not be able to interact with us deliberately if you want to call it the prime directive that's fine uh, but I, I could I could see the point there, and that is if you influence them too much, then whatever civilization's on the ground doesn't get to develop naturally. So anyway, sorry, long long point to your question. I think for me, I think they're in here with us. A lot of them are. I don't think they have well, to leave. The surely, dome. if 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 there was um, species, you know, if if there was human kinds and civilizations that come before us, why would they move over and let the next one flourish? Surely they'd just carry on, or they'd want to get out and explore. Um, who Rather knows? Maybe, maybe that's just how the process works. Uh, I, I don't know everything. Uh, the the line I used was uh, line I like using is the um the movie Contact, which I know a lot of nerds hated. Um, if you, if you remember it, where her one of her first questions was, uh, did you build it? You know, did you build the transport mm -hmm. system? And he goes, we didn't build it. We don't know who did. Uh, all we do is follow, you know, the follow whatever the people did in front of us. You know, we're, we're just following the procedure that's been passed on forever and ever. I mean, I can I can see that, uh, you know, like like just take our civilization, for example. You know, we've gone on broken history you know, about 5000 years, and, but we seem to have kind of peaked out where there's there's nothing new. We've we've run out of novelty. We've run out of new ideas. And it seems like we're kind of going through the motion. We're, we're just kind of grinding gears and it, it kind of feels like there's some some and I'm, I'm not trying to be a pessimist I, i'm a glass half full kind of guy um it kind of feels like we're coming to a conclusion you know whatever whatever act three is going to be the big song and dance number we we seem to be in in that middle between um act two and act three where uh there, there's got to be some sort of some sort of conclusion to our story if we're living in a story, I where, where that's going, I'm not I'm not sure yet. I hope it's a golden age. I really do. Sorry, that's my rent. <laughs> yeah, interesting. But I mean, you know, obviously we've well, got to, we've got to agree to disagree because obviously I'm just, I, my, my mind is scientific. So of, of course, of course. Yeah, I, I went to I went to a site. I mean, there's a lot of sites to talk about flat Earth, why it's not, and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they give some some different. Uh, Different things like uh, the moon mm -hmm. is one of the reasons. Uh, lunar eclipses, ships on the horizon, like Gary brought up, sure, sure, when sure. ships actually go across the horizon. I've seen it myself. I, I was in the Navy, and I was actually up on up on the uh, O4 deck with the big eyes, and you mm -hmm. can see stuff go over the over the horizon. It is a really cool thing, and and you can see the ship is actually disappearing over the horizon. It, and I'm using 
these gig- if you, I don't know if you ever looked through uh, what they call the big eyes on a sh- on a navy ship, mm-hmm. but they're gigantic um, binoculars. Right. And they they're huge. They're literally about three feet long and they have a giant lens in them, and you can see for miles without a problem. Sure. And you can see I can see ships go right over the horizon, mm-hmm. and um, you know one of the things they have in here is varying star constellations, and what they give is the um, on a flat Earth model. You could see the constellations. If you were here, you could see the constellations, but around the curve of the Earth, Mm -hmm. you couldn't see the other constellations, whereas because they rotate over as the Earth rotates. But on a flat Earth theory, you'd be able to see all the constellations. The Earth blocks some of the constellations you see, your field of view. So as you're looking at things, you know, you can see like when I look at the Big Dipper, the Big Dipper moves all night around me. Uh, And other places on Earth will be able to see the Big Dipper. Right. It's not that, that they can't see at the same time, even though it's night. Like in California, you'll see the big dipper in a different spot than I will. Mm-hmm. Um, so well, it's, yep. it's it, the other the other things are you know shadows on sticks. So if shadows on sticks on a flat Earth, right. they would all they would all face the right the the same direction. Whereas shadow on sticks for uh, a, a curvature of the Earth, they would constantly move and they would go in different directions. Yeah. Um, Seeing the Earth, uh, seeing things from a higher vantage point, like we talked about, flat Earth. You're looking at the tree, and the um, your field of view is greater from the from a higher point, mm-hmm. from a higher point. And it's not that the air gets any thinner. The, if I go a hundred feet in the air, the Earth it doesn't make the Earth the air so thin. I can, that I can see that I can see further because the air is thinner of a hundred feet. It just makes them higher up, and I can see further out. Yeah, with the same look with my eyes, I'll be able to see more the higher up I go because, yeah, it's just that's you know belief of that. Mm-hmm. Um, and the other thing is you know the existence of time zones, which and uh, blah, 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 the pull of gravity, yep. and all that. Now, on your flat Earth model, which I see all the time, mm-hmm. you guys have the center of the Earth is the North Pole, correct? Right. Why? Why wouldn't it be? Oh, you mean like why just why is it that why is that the center of the planet? Why the North Pole and not Australia or some other place? Uh, because if the if uh, because the flat Earth is still circular, so you have to have a a center point. So that would be. Oh, I mean, like, we don't we don't call it the center of the Earth. It's just for us, it's just magnetic north, more than anything. But you have a magnetic south also if you go around to the South Pole. Uh, no, we do not. Uh, as a matter of fact, I had a Australian intelligence officer who I talked to, oh boy, it had to have been a couple of years ago now, who said that, he goes, when, when you're going to the South Pole, or heading you know, the Southern Hemisphere, when you get to a certain point, you would expect to see the Southern, you know, the compass for the South dominate, you know, like, like the North. Eventually, it's got to flip. That's one of the common questions. You know, we, we don't think about it here in the northern hemisphere because we're always dealing with north. And he goes, he goes, look, I'm telling you, he goes, that south dominance thing, he goes, that never happens. It's never, ever there, uh, and which makes sense in our map because the outer ring, remember, for us, there is no north, south, east, or west. There's just, lack of a better word, the North Pole, what it's called because we're all used to calling it the North Pole. And then the outer ring is you want to call it south in every direction i suppose you could uh but no we don't we don't ever see a south south pole dominance so anyway sorry to answer to answer the first part no the the it, if it's a circle then the center is whatever the center is and in this case it just happens to be the north pole okay i'm um, just um i know you're, re- I, you're, I you're reading through of, a lot I, of stuff i could i could I see am. it i yeah because you know there is a uh south uh, geomagnetic pole. Mm. The Earth's geomagnetic pole can be approximated. Right, uh, right, 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 right. And and but, the core know, of I'm sorry, the core of the Earth is made up of what again? I believe it's iron. It says who? Well, it says people that are sending. Um... Nope. Nope. Oh, okay. Nope. 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 The, in fact, this this is why I want people to watch the clues before they talk to me. So if you believe, but here's the thing. Yeah. I, the, here's the thing. Um. You have you have a group of scientists that are taking a lot of time to to do this stuff and right. to explore the Earth. We know the mantle, the crust, and all those things. And you're just by saying 
we have people that believe different doesn't mean the other part's wrong. I mean, you because you come on hard. To be honest with you, you come. I mean, probably people come hard on you too. Is you know screaming you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. Right. But I'm just you want people to believe to respect your opinion about things. You mm. need to respect what we you know are understanding. Oh no, I I hear you. I do. But there okay. are certain topics that are very touchy with me, and one of them, the most probably more than anything is the core of the earth because and i'll start real quick with uh, this only takes a minute uh neil what neil degrasse tyson said it was one of the most arrogant things i've ever heard which was science is true whether or not you believe in it and i don't want to go off into like products that were released ahead of time which did a lot of damage because science took the money no let's forget about it. we'll put that off the side we'll put off military well, they weapons do that in medicine too i mean look at all the medicines that are out there i mean well yeah but those are scientists that devise them but that's a whole other thing let me let me do the the core of the earth real quick which is okay. they you you will open up any textbook i mean any textbook going back a long time and they show you this cross section of the earth which shows you know those wonderful bands we've all seen you know red and orange and yellow and then that white milky center right and if you believe mainstream science, then it's 4,000 miles to the center of the Earth. If the Earth is 8,000 miles wide, give or take a few miles, it's 4,000 miles to the center. How deep is the deepest hole ever drilled? Is nine it miles. A, it's, not, yeah, it's not even nine miles. It's, eight, it's like eight miles, 12, 12 kilometers. And the Germans and the Russians tried for a long time. They tried for the better part of, I think, a decade at least to each of them, trying to punch below that. And they couldn't. Remember, 1% of the distance to the core is 40 miles, and they drilled eight. So a fraction of a percent, not even, not even 1% did they, did they drill, and yet they show you these cross-sections like they're absolute gospel. And in the old days, they actually used to put in small print, and here's what really bugged me, in small print, this is not, you know, this is just an uh, extrapolation, blah, 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 whatever verbs they use. They don't really know what's down there, but science is notorious for not leaving question marks in the middle of things because they don't like, they won't want people coming at them and bugging them about it. So eventually, they just remove the text, and then it became law. And that was, we know what the core of the Earth looks like. Oh, yeah, by the way, here's what the core of Venus and Saturn and all these others look like as well. And it's like, what are you talking about? You've never been there. You've never drilled down. You haven't even come close. And yet you're telling us that's what it is. You show a nine-year-old this picture, and then they see it again when they're 18. These people are willing to fight for that belief, for that picture. That's when science becomes scientism. That's when science goes too far. And I know it's human nature. People go too far all the time in corporations and entertainment and sports. I know people do it. It's, it's what we do. But science, I think, should have a higher standard. And But we could say the same thing about your theory of, I mean, we were talking, you know, one of the reasons that the, the, the flat earth is formed the way it's formed mm -hmm. is the one of the things you said before was, that if you go too high, the air gets too thin, you can't survive. Right. So that's one way to keep it there. If you go too low, there's you, you had talked about lava machines right. that create lava. Sure. They come around. So, you know, when we look at – no one's ever produced a lava machine. No one's right. ever seen a lava machine. Right. But, you know, when you look at it in a mainstream way and we look at it as, is okay, I'm going to talk to a guy on the street, right. you know, um, do you believe in lava machines? They'd say, you know, what the hell? And I know you're saying because mainstream science has always said this, but, you know, you guys are saying lava machines, but where do you get your proof of these things, that these things would exist? Right. I mean, is there anyone ever seen one? Has anyone nope. ever heard of one? No, nope. no. Nope. And just a theory. And absolutely just a theory. Okay. But at the same okay. time, again, remember, I treat it like a, like a court case. Can I prove the, the flat earth w without a no i cannot prove the flat earth but i can create so much and i say i i mean we we can create so much reasonable doubt in the globe so much of it that you and remember the the flat earth community is really divided on a lot of issues i mean we only have like 70 percent of the community that even believes that it's enclosed the rest just think it's that's flat you know like 30 30 percent don't even believe in the in the dome and yet every one of them says the same thing which is we all know we all know at least one thing which is we don't buy the globe anymore it's sort of like the um the, the scottish highlands you know they can they can whack each other with claymores all they want but at the end of the day they all still hate the english you know I'm, what I mean? hey sorry john i don't care oh sorry <laughs> no 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 it's not it, no it's not 
I, I, I don't. Well, British politics, or I'm sorry, UK politics. I don't know all the subtle nuances, but I, I, I don't I know think anybody it. does really. Nobody does. Okay. Nobody has a clue. Okay, so Dave, Doctor Dave, uh, put a thing in here. He put a, a picture of the Earth up there. He says today by using uh, seismology and magnetic field data as well as other theoretical calculations. Mm -hmm. It is possible. I know you're going to jump on the word theoretical. No, 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 no. Uh, a sense of the actual size and composition of our of our planet, our planet's nether regions, because there is no way to to get to the mantle. You know that's what we got to do, and that's came from a Harvard professor right. that is um, that commented I, on. It. I know it's the, it's the fine print, kind of like what everybody reads when they when they do the software agreements. You know, I agree. You know, you have to use the new browser. Nobody reads through that. Uh, it's the same thing, and, and science knows this. And so they have made some leaps where – and I, I know, you know, they want to they wanna be respectable and, and, and want to be, you know, these, these pillars of authority. Uh, but sometimes you just got to say, we, you know, we, we're not there yet. We haven't we, – we don't know what's down there. And they, they went the other way. It's like, no, we absolutely know what's down there and other things. And I'm sorry, just – but but I don't like it was it was one of the clues. But for me, it, it just was a, a symptom of a, of a greater problem, which is and I, and I don't want to turn this into a science versus religion thing. I, I really, really don't. But science fell into the same traps as some of the major religions did, which was, OK, if you put on the white coat and everybody believes whatever the white coats say, then it's too tempting not to go too far. And that's. That's kind of one one of the the draws of, of what we have, which is you know don't don't do look for yourself, ask your own questions, do your own research if you can. So let me ask you one of the questions I have for you is I was when in the military I was in communications. Right. So if the Earth is flat, why would we need satellites to communicate with other places? Because we use satellites. If we've all seen Independence Day, right. when the aliens took out our satellites and so we couldn't communicate. <laughs> <laughs> why wouldn't the line of sight work? Why wouldn't the line of sight work completely? Thank you, by the way. Cable. I'm sorry. What? You 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 wouldn't need a satellite for communication because if the Earth's flat, you, you'll just piggyback it off of every mast nah, available yep. or every cable. Yep, yep, yep. That's what. In fact, that's one of my clues. Which was uh, okay. First, let me address the the satellite thing. Um, when it comes to satellites, do I think there's stuff floating around up there? Sure. Sure, of course I do. Um, you can watch some fantastic videos, uh, government videos, uh, started by NASA even before they did the rockets thing as part of their high-altitude balloon projects where they can lift stuff upwards of eight tons. Now, uh, if you can lift a, an eight-ton a piece of electronics via balloon, why the heck would you do anything with the rockets? The rockets are just for show more than more than anything but when it comes to communications most of it is still done on the ground there was an old old system well, i shouldn't say old system uh 60s transitioning to the 70s and even to the 80s called the loran system and forgive me i don't know what the acronym stands for uh but it was a military system and eventually they transitioned it in what they called now today the gps which was designed by um, the united states department of defense back in the 90s but the funny thing is this this 32 satellite multi blanket coverage system has these huge massive gaps in it that should not be there and by that and and again i didn't come up with this somebody else referred it to me and i just you know did my own searches on this and that was when planes especially in the southern oceans uh, southern atlantic pacific southern pacific and, and indian oceans when planes get about just outside of, of maximum radar range uh, at about 150, 200 miles off the coast, their latitude and longitude, uh, things go off. They're, they turn off and they go into approximated or estimated mode. The GPS system doesn't or shouldn't work like that. There's There should not be any huge gaps. And I've had people, pilots from all over the place, says, no, the gaps aren't just there. They're all over the place. And that that shouldn't be. The every every communication guy that I have talked to said that whatever's flying in the sky is used for minimal minimal bandwidth. The rest of it is fiber optics. Everything that we've laid in the seas, and we have laid a lot a lot of stuff in the seas to compensate for it. How do you explain magnetic fields? How are they generated? Uh, how are they generated in a globe? 
and, and that's not me being a smart ass trying to trying to come back at you but same sort of thing um there are processes that would be on a flat world a flat stationary world that would be that would work pretty much identically so kind of like a float like for example people have, uh, i would imagine your follow-up question would eventually be what about the, like the floating magnetic north which which we know is a real thing you know the, the north magnetic pole seems to drift a little bit which is which is weird and some people say well it's because of the spinning of the earth or spinning of the core and all these different things in the internal but it could also be done internally in a controlled mechanism uh, again we we've done stuff when we build things now mostly in simulations we can make just about anything you want uh, everything from gravitational fields to magnetic fields to you name it uh, just it's just I, I don't want to use the word mechanical or electronic because it sounds too too old but uh, let's just say they are artificial that's a good word maybe I'll keep using that but the, the thing is the machine would have to be so massive yeah to create that strong magnetic field again just massive to us though we we're are we really big or are we really small uh science science fiction even scientists have talked about this for a long time and that is what what are we in comparison to other life forms other civilizations uh what is you know, what is size is is size relative like time and space which and... is relative to, to its so, size is relative to the person involved and it? it's the same as i can say that i'm tall standing next to a load of five-year-olds but if I'm standing with the Harlem Globetrotters, I'm sure. There you go. Yeah, I'm at six foot. There you go. I mean, I've I I even think there was a wonderful story, uh, even though I know science laughs at it, uh, that circulated through our our channels about uh, that that the old that there's there's remnants of ver like the old versions of this world back when you know there was Pangaea, the supercontinent that everything was made very very big. And there's like the, the dinosaurs, you know, if, and I do believe in dinosaurs. Uh, I know some people don't. Uh, were actually just just lizards. You know, they were they weren't very big at all. But uh, you know, in comparison, but because the world was made so big, you know, back then everything was everything was bigger. Kind of like what we do now, when uh, you know our old versions of uh, remember the old supercomputers used to take up oh geez a city block. Oh room, yeah. Yeah, and now you mm. can condense it down into you know the size of a laptop. Um, is, isn't it possible again I'm not I'm not picking on whoever designed this place but isn't it possible that as they made better and better versions they just kept like the Japanese they just kept making it smaller and smaller and smaller to where now we can make uh, music devices which are absolutely inoperable it, it's too small for our fingers well that's from alien technology we all know that that started at Roswell <laughs> <laughs> yeah well yeah and, and by the way I believe in Roswell I do. I, do. Um, I think I think it was a, a cool, cool thing. Uh, it wasn't the greatest UFO thing in uh, of of all time. Uh, nor was the 1899 Aurora, Texas. My favorite uh, UFO thing, and I don't know if I mentioned the last time I talked to you guys, was uh, in Europe. It was fif the 1561 Nuremberg event, and you can wiki that thing. It is the coolest thing ever. Where 1561, two giant armadas fought on a beautiful spring day over Nuremberg, Germany uh, for like an hour. And all the sketch artists were out there drawing it. And, and they said it was absolutely fascinating. Uh, Did you ever of course, hear that one, John? I never heard of that one. The 1561 Nuremberg? Oh, okay. Let me let me tell you, break it down. No, I never quick. heard of it. So like eight something in the morning, again, cloudless sky. Uh, it wasn't any sun dogs. Two giants would only be described as like aircraft carriers just came out and launched fighters at each other one were like disc shaped the other they described as like cross shape who knows maybe they maybe those were like winged planes who knows and they hammered on each other for like an hour over the city to the point where they actually could see who was winning and who was losing and you know these people are out there an hour is a long time they're out there draw, they're sketching this thing having their toast and schnitz and glubin and, and watching the whole thing go down and after an hour, a third faction shows up and a, a singular black armored ship, this, this angular thing, this, this menacing looking ship pulls up between the two of them and they scatter and, and they take off. And then the, that black ship wait for a little while and then, and then took off. It is that thing just screams so many questions. Uh, one is hierarchy. <laughs> it's like, okay, who are these first two in the first place? Why were they fighting over a major city, which you're not supposed to do? 
who was this who was the third faction in relation to these two were they the cops were they the un who was who what was year it? was that 1561 was you can't miss it look up look up 1561 um and the ghost are un the what the, if it was the un yeah. and of course the biggest question it's like what sort of response time is an hour did these guys find like a dead zone to where they weren't they knew they weren't going to be spotted for a while was it was it like a like a yeah, turf April war? 14th i got it right here yeah it's a fa look at the woodcut of that thing it was it was the most amazing thing ever nobody ever ancient aliens talked about it once and i thought it was really interesting because even ancient aliens left out the part about the the third faction when they uh, when they were talking about it they did not mention that third black ship because it really adds a, a layer of depth to the story uh and now of course in 1561 there was no science fiction and so everybody thought it was biblical but even then it's like uh they didn't f w go to the bible and try to figure out what's going on with these things uh I, I loved it i thought it was the, the the coolest thing ever if i ever get a time travel machine that's one of the first places i'm going i'm gonna sit down with some toast and some juice and watch this <laughs> so uh as our time draws near to the end i would have to ask you mark yes. what would be one thing if and i'm sure you thought about it what would what convince would be one me thing what would convince me that it's a globe to go the other way yep yeah, yep yep no way. it's a wonderful question you want to end on this one no, no, no. We got 15 okay. minutes. So I just oh, okay. want to know, right. you know. All right. So the one thing it used to, I am so glad you asked this because I actually turned this into a clue, which is called uh, the lost nail. Or if uh, anyone knows, you know, for want of a nail, the shoe and then the horse and the rider and blah, blah, blah. So somebody asked me, they said, more than one person asked me, it's like, okay, what would it take? And, and this wasn't just for me. It was for the entire community. And I said, well, it would probably have to be, you know, some 4K camera that was attached to a rocket and you, you'd have to, no edits, you'd have to have that facing down to where the, when the rocket went up, you'd see the curvature of the earth. You know, not, none of this, you know, it can't be curved when it's on the ground. It's got to be, you know, a, a, you know, a flat, flat shot. And then when it goes up, you can, you can basically a rocket pulling away from the earth. And it's like, yeah, it's never. So done. do you think that's something, cause you guys had talked, you got, you fired that one old guy into the air, like 1800 feet. <laughs> that poor son of a bitch. Right. Okay. <laughs> you look, well, that the, was funny. The I Mad, the Mad Mike was, thing. I, yeah. I have got to clarify this. Okay. Mad Mike. He was, I know he's going to get mad again and, and demand another apology from me. Uh, he was, but he was just riding on our coattails on this one. He knew that Flat Earth was was trending and he came to us for money. And he and he said, hey, I'd like to finish my rocket project because if I if if I get some money from you guys, can can I put a Flat Earth sticker on the side? And it's like, yeah, yeah, that's, that's what we find. And then he he didn't launch twice. And of course, it had nothing to do with proving the Flat Earth. He just wanted to do the whole evil Knievel daredevil thing. And I'm going dude, it's not 1976 anymore. Nobody cares about daredevils, but whatever, whatever you want to do. Um, but it was more of an awareness thing than anything else. It was great press. I'll give you that. I mean, just all this, all this media was was all over him. But uh, and and he didn't get. I I know. You know, he hits the ground. You know, with the parachute, and he comes out. It's like, oh my back. He was fine. Was he was he was to, he, he was totally milking that for the because uh, there was a documentary so, documentary team following him. Oh, of course. I mean, I would I would never do that stuff. I mean, I'm not oh, I, I, I actually volunteered. Shit. I volunteered. Uh, I was pushing him. I volunteered to be the uh, the backup pilot. Oh uh, my god! Well, you, you're a nut. You're a nut, man. No, 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 no. <laughs> it's, Look, I look. I'm old enough to remember the evil Knievel. It's a steam powered rocket. It's not like um, as long as the parachute goes, you're fine. You know, you go in an amusement park ride, you're putting your life in their hands. I mean, granted, this would be a little more risky, but I would have totally done it if it would. The, the point was to get him off his ass and, and get this thing going because he had already blown, you know, d bailed twice. So it's like, dude, dude, just launch already. You know, don't start. Anyway, that that. So the point was that was initially my thought was get some sort of 4K rocket or sorry, 4K um camera on a rocket but I was going, that's never going to happen people so would... well here's my question what? since you guys are putting all this money into stuff yeah. would your organization do that what to prove it put a 4k camera on a rocket sure and fire it up sure absolutely and just... absolutely would but who's going to approve it i mean there's only two groups you can go to right now to get that sort of thing one of them would be nasa and they're never going to see us and the other one's going to be elon musk and but here's the thing. Yeah. What if you build a rocket and just shoot the damn thing in the air? What are they going to do? You know, the rocket police going to come get you? Well, I mean, they're not going to. 
it, believe it or not, there are rules to that. You can't, especially in the United States. I, we'd have to go somewhere else and do it. And the, the U.S. is really touchy about building rockets because technically, and I only know this from personal experience, uh, technically they're considered uh, uh, weapons of mass destruction once they get to be a certain size. Even without a, they'd have to, they, you'd have to have government supervision along the entire, th the entire way. If you're going to do something like that, you just cannot build something that big. On it. Plus, good Lord. I mean, the engineering involved and, and the money would be ridiculous. Anyway, because of that, all these things, the, the hurdles, I came up with a test. It's way easier. It's way, 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 way easier. Mm -hmm. um, and that sure is, um, you can, in fact, it's a test. You can do it on the ground. Does, d will this test absolutely prove it's a flat earth? No, but it would go a long, long way in restoring any sort of uh, confidence in, in NASA or the space programs. And that was uh, the spacesuit test, which, I, and, and, I, and I know that I, I, I'm really, really confident in this test, and you'll understand why in a second. So I thought, I was like, okay, I need, I need a common denominator here, something on the ground that's tied to all the space programs. And I go, well, it's a spacesuit. That's what it is. And it's only because I had a couple guests that came on the show, again, unsolicited. One was uh, an industrial vacuum expert, and the other was an um, industrial engineer specializing in valves and seals. And they both said the same thing. They go, look, the general public doesn't understand how strong the force of a vacuum is, where you, you know, have no molecules versus some molecules. It's not like a little air versus, you know, some air. And he goes, the, the, the force of a vacuum is really, really strong. And I go, yeah, okay, what's your point? He goes, my point is, he goes, the, the astronaut suit is just a fabric balloon. That's all it is. You know, it's, it's pliable. It's, it's, there's, there's nothing to it. It's literally just a fabric balloon. He goes, how in the world is that thing being exposed to a vacuum? How, how does that thing not go as tight as a snare drum and then burst? He, he goes, it's impossible. We're talking, and we're not talking advanced physics or, or even basics physics. We're, we're talking balloon physics, which I know, is, but there's multiple le multiple levels to every spacesuit. There's the outer shell, there's the inner shell. It doesn't, doesn't matter if there's an outer shell or inner shell or not. The bottom line is, if it's pliable, that air on the the, the high pressure, higher pressure on the inside is going to want to get out. It's the, it's the, uh, the reverse, of, again, this is for your listeners, the reverse of this is a submarine, which is, you know, when a submarine can only get so far before it hits crush depth, right? And then right. eventually it just, you know, just crushes in like a... Like well, a that's because, the, because water's a mass that uh, sits on top of it. Yes, but, but that's the pressure, right? You know, it's, it's coming in, it's coming in from all sides, but yeah, it's, you're right, it's absolute mass. The vacuum is the exact opposite, where is you've got the, the high pressure on the inside, which gets amplified because on the outside is nothing it is you know there's no there's nothing out there and the that it wants to equalize so badly it's trying to get out and nasa in the beginning when they were designing their spacesuits you can look up the old archives they're, they're pretty interesting they knew this was a problem they knew that we're talking about a balloon basically and so they were trying to come up with hard shell versions of it plastics and metals and composites and and stuff like this and it was just going nowhere and eventually at the very end they just changed back to fabric and it's like oh yeah it totally works and we'll go with that and and that's it it's like what are you, what are you talking about there's no that there wouldn't be any articulation points you you wouldn't be able to bend your knees your arms your fingers you certainly wouldn't be able to hook up electronics or anything like that how does the suit work and so that was my my uh, my test i told people you think you think the the me getting into a rocket was crazy this one shouldn't be crazy but it sounds like it when you hear it is fine you you want to convince me it's, it's a globe get me an astronaut suit anything from the, the 60s up until now put me in a vacuum chamber pull the switch tell me how it's tell me how i don't die tell me how that suit doesn't go tight as a drum and i just feel <laughs> so over you're not willing to do that apparently absolutely i'm willing to do that oh it's willing to want to vacuum and die for your no, cause no no, no no i i of course you know <laughs> be a martyr for flat earth hey that's great but they'll never do it meaning it's and of course i put the challenge i said look if you're gonna if you're gonna put me in there you better be in there as well if you're gonna if you're gonna pony up for science my point is this is look i'm a huge i've watched a lot of media i've watched a lot of sci-fi and here's what really caught caught my attention and that is forget about in the suit right you know because we're talking about you know a stationary backpack 
You know, you've seen the Apollo guys, right? It's just a backpack there. Forget about the oxygen or the heating or the cooling or the humidity levels. Those are all things we can do in a scuba suit now, right? That's easy by comparison. Tell me what's in that backpack that stops that suit from turning into a parade float. Tell me how it's done because it's, we're just talking about pressure equalization. There is, I couldn't even think of a fictional technology. A, pick your genre, Star Wars, Star Trek, Stargate, pick a fictional world. Tell me what you would need to do that. Short of a individual force field, I can't think of a, of a way you could do this. And, and so, it's, 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 so the point was, if the suit doesn't work, and it doesn't, then even if, and even if you could, even if you could, well, let's, let's throw one more caveat in there. Even if you could convince me in 2018 that we have the digital technology to regulate all those things and control the vacuum, tell me how we did it in 1969. Tell me how we did it back then with, with analog. Tell me how all the astronauts were running around the moon, never checked a single gauge. In fact, we never even saw a single gauge. Nobody was tapping on things saying, hey, Bob, I think we might be running out of air. Or, hey, my pressure seems a little weird. Hey, my ear just popped. Nobody says that crap. The, and if the suits are wrong, if the suits can't happen, then anything that showed the suits can't happen. And then the whole thing just starts crumbling. The whole thing just starts crumbling. So you you don't believe in the, in the, the moon landing. Are you the one that believe? are you a person that believes that Stanley Kubrick produced it uh stanley stanley would have been an excellent choice back in the day you, let me tell you a fun fact yeah stanley kubrick the last movie he did was eyes wide shut 1999 yeah greatest year in movies right. did you know that stanley kubrick died 666 days before january 1st 2001 i did know this i think it that's I, a Creepy ass I, th fact. I think it was I think it was also written into his contract. He if he I'll would throw, die at that time. I'll, I'll throw. Well, no, 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 no. There, there was something. Sorry, written to his contract about the release of the movie. Um, look it up if you get a chance. The release of Eyes Wide Shut was tied to Apollo in some way. But yeah, that yeah, is but weird. I mean, the, but on the death, that, is, the death thing. That's that's weird too. You're absolutely right. My son told me about that because he there's all kinds of theories that he didn't cut so much of the movie, and that's the reason he was killed. Yeah, I mean, let's. There was a wonderful documentary that was done, and you guys, I'm sure you've heard of it, uh, called Room Two Three Seven, which was how uh, a guy broke down the movie The Shining because I actually didn't know that the Kubrick directed The Shining, and uh, until until years later, and that in The Shining when he directed it, he actually built in the confession to Apollo. Uh, through it he basically threw out the Stephen King novel and wrote his own script and there were these little breadcrumbs left all over the movie it's a fascinating documentary where uh, he, he goes into it now all, all that being said yeah the Apollo the Apollo program you'd have to throw away of course along with with everything but even the Apollo program made sense which was um, uh, it's something that I had toyed with for years. It's like, yeah, yeah, I, I, I understand the, the moon stuff has aged terribly and don't believe anything the Americans ever did in space and, and blah, blah, blah. But I couldn't come up with a good enough reason. Why, why would you fake the space program? Would it be, you know, rah, rah, wave the flag, go team, go America? It's like, yeah, it's good, but that's yeah, a lot of money for that. And then once I got into this, you know, once I got into the whole enclosed world thing, then it's like, oh, okay, it's not that they wanted to, they had to. You, you have to, you've got to get the moon out of the way. You've got to get that, that mystery done when it comes to the public. You've got to go there, you go there quickly, say it's super boring, we don't need to go there anymore, good night everybody, and then that's it. You shut it down in 1972 and nobody goes back ever since. Yeah, is, that's because the spider documentary I watched called uh, Apollo 18, I think it was. It's a documentary about spiders. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, but people, some people actually quoted me that because they said, because I, I was some, one of my clues, they said there's only been two movies ever made, made about the space program, and they were two ever in, in Hollywood. None of them landed on the moon. Uh, one was um, Apollo 13, and the other was uh, The Right Stuff. And then somebody actually quoted me. They said, oh, it's Apollo well, Apollo 18 was a movie. I was going, no, that was the rock monsters that lived on yeah. the moon and eight astronauts. Hey, uh, Matthew Sales has a question. Let's ask him about our existence as a species. What's the deal with that? Our... Guys, it's time to wrap up. Okay, oh. what's what, well, I, I can answer it real quick if I know what the question is. The Our existence? Yeah, why What, us? you mean, like, why? We're going to get out because we've got a show after us, so. Okay, sorry. Why humans? Why, why I don't I don't get the question. Why humans instead of something else? Like lizards, 
What, you I mean, like, why, why humanoids? I have no idea. <laughs> Okay. We're, we're, All right. Well, look, we're going to wrap sorry. it up, Mark. Thanks okay. a lot for being on. And Thanks, uh, we'll guys. see you next week. I will be off next week. So it'll be John and Gary on next week. I got to move my daughter into college. Cool. So thanks, Mark, for being on. Uh, we'll see everybody next week. Same bat time, same bat channel. All right. Bye, guys.